Chapter Thirteen of The Man Who Is Thursday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Zachary Brewster Geis, Greenbelt, Maryland, June 2007. The Man Who Was Thursday, A Nightmare, by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 13. The Pursuit of the President. Next morning five bewildered but hilarious people took the boat for Dover. The poor old colonel might have had some cause to complain, having been first forced to fight for two factions that didn't exist, and then knocked down with an iron lantern. But he was a magnanimous old gentleman, and being much relieved that neither party had anything to do with dynamite, he saw them off on the pier with great geniality. The five reconciled detectives had a hundred details to explain to each other. The secretary had to tell Syme how they had come to wear masks originally in order to approach the supposed enemy as fellow conspirators. Syme had to explain how they had fled with such swiftness through a civilized country. But above all these matters of detail which could be explained rose the central mountain of the matter that they could not explain. What did it all mean? If they were all harmless officers, what was Sunday? If he had not seized the world, what on earth had he been up to? Inspector Ratcliffe was still gloomy about this. "'I can't make head a tail of old Sunday's little game any more than you can,' he said. "'But whatever else Sunday is, he isn't a blameless citizen. Damn it, do you remember his face?' "'I grant you,' answered Syme, "'that I have never been able to forget it.' "'Well,' said the secretary, "'I suppose we can find out soon, for tomorrow we have our next general meeting.' "'You will excuse me,' he said, with a rather ghastly smile, "'for being well acquainted with my secretarial duties.' "'I suppose you are right,' said the professor reflectively. "'I suppose we might find it out from him. "'But I confess that I should feel a bit afraid "'of asking Sunday who he really is.' "'Why?' asked the secretary. "'For fear of bombs?' "'No,' said the professor. "'For fear he might tell me.' "'Let us have some drinks,' said Dr. Bull, after silence. Throughout their whole journey by boat and train they were highly convivial, but they instinctively kept together. Dr. Bull, who had always been the optimist of the party, endeavored to persuade the other four that the whole company could take the same handsome cab from Victoria, but this was overruled, and they went in a four-wheeler with Dr. Bull on the box, singing. They finished their journey at a hotel in Piccadilly Circus, so as to be close to the early breakfast next morning in Leicester Square. Yet even then the adventures of the day were not entirely over. Dr. Bull, discontented with the general proposal to go to bed, had strolled out of the hotel at about eleven to see and taste some of the beauties of London. Twenty minutes afterwards he came back and made quite a clamour in the hall. Syme, who tried at first to soothe him, was forced at last to listen to his communication with quite new attention. "'I tell you I've seen him!' said Dr. Bull, with thick emphasis. "'Whom?' asked Syme quickly. "'Not the President?' "'Not so bad as that,' said Dr. Bull, with unnecessary laughter. "'Not so bad as that. I've got him here.' "'Got whom here?' asked Syme impatiently. "'Harry man,' said the other lucidly. "'Man that used to be Harry man. Gogol. Here he is.' And he pulled forward by a reluctant elbow the identical young man who five days before had marched out of the council with thin red hair and a pale face, the first of all the sham anarchists who had been exposed." "'Why do you worry with me?' he cried. "'You have expelled me as a spy.' "'We are all spies,' whispered Syme. "'We're all spies!' shouted Dr. Bull. "'Come and have a drink!' Next morning the battalion of the reunited six marched stolidly towards the hotel in Leicester Square. "'This is more cheerful,' said Dr. Bull. "'We are six men, going to ask one man what he means.' "'I think it is a bit queerer than that,' said Syme. "'I think it is six men going to ask one man what they mean.' They turned in silence into the square, and though the hotel was in the opposite corner, they saw at once the little balcony and a figure that looked too big for it. He was sitting alone with bent head, poring over a newspaper. But all his counsellors, who had come to vote him down, crossed that square as if they were watched out of heaven by a hundred eyes. They had disputed much upon their policy, about whether they should leave the unmasked Gogol without and begin diplomatically, or whether they should bring him in and blow up the gunpowder at once. 
The influence of Simon Bull prevailed for the latter course, though the secretary to the last asked them why they attacked Sunday so rashly. "'My reason is quite simple,' said Syme. "'I attack him rashly, because I am afraid of him.' They followed Syme up the dark stair in silence, and they all came out simultaneously into the broad sunlight of the morning and the broad sunlight of Sunday's smile. "'Delightful,' he said. "'So pleased to see you all. What an exquisite day it is. Is the Tsar dead?' The secretary, who happened to be foremost, drew himself together for a dignified outburst. "'No, sir,' he said sternly. "'There has been no massacre. I bring you news of no such disgusting spectacles.' "'Disgusting spectacles?' repeated the President, with a bright, inquiring smile. "'You mean Dr. Bull's spectacles?' The secretary choked for a moment, and the President went on with a sort of smooth appeal. "'Of course, we all have our opinions, and even our eyes, but really to call them disgusting, before the man himself.' Dr. Bull tore off his spectacles and broke them on the table. "'My spectacles are blaggardly,' he said, "'but I'm not. Look at my face!' "'I dare say it's the sort of face that grows on one,' said the President. "'In fact, it grows on you. And who am I to quarrel with the wild fruits upon the tree of life? I dare say it will grow on me some day.' "'We have no time for tomfoolery,' said the Secretary, breaking in savagely. "'We have come to know what all this means. Who are you? What are you? Why did you get us all here? Do you know who and what we are? Are you a half-witted man playing the conspirator, or are you a clever man playing the fool? Answer me, I tell you!' "'Candidates,' murmured Sunday, "'are only required to answer eight out of the seventeen questions on the paper. "'As far as I can make out, you want me to tell you what I am and what you are "'and what this table is, and what the council is, and what this world is, for all I know. "'Well, I will go so far as to rend the veil of one mystery. "'If you want to know what you are, you are a set of highly well-intentioned young jackasses.' "'And you,' said Syme, leaning forward, "'what are you?' "'I?' "'What am I?' roared the President, and he rose slowly to an incredible height, like some enormous wave about to arch above them and break. "'You want to know what I am, do you? Bull, you are a man of science. Grub in the roots of those trees and find out the truth about them. Syme, you are a poet. Stare at those morning clouds. But I tell you this, that you will have found out the truth of the last tree and the topmost clouds before the truth about me.' You will understand the sea, and I shall still be a riddle. You shall know what the stars are, and not know what I am. Since the beginning of the world, all men have hunted me like a wolf. Kings and sages, and poets and lawgivers, all the churches, and all the philosophies. But I have never been caught yet, and the skies will fall in the time I turn to bay. I have given them a good run for their money, and I will now." Before one of them could move, the monstrous man had swung himself like some huge orangutan over the balustrade of the balcony. Yet before he dropped, he pulled himself up again as on a horizontal bar, and thrusting his great chin over the edge of the balcony, said solemnly, "'There's one thing I'll tell you, though, about who I am. I am the man in the dark room who made you all policemen.' With that, he fell from the balcony, bouncing on the stones below like a great ball of India rubber and went bounding off towards the corner of the Alhambra, where he hailed a handsome cab and sprang inside it. The six detectives had been standing thunderstruck and livid in the light of his last assertion, but when he disappeared into the cab, Syme's practical senses returned to him, and leaping over the balcony so recklessly as almost to break his legs, he called another cab. He and Bull sprang into the cab together, the professor and the inspector into another, while the secretary and the late Gogol scrambled into a third just in time to pursue the flying Syme, who was pursuing the flying president. Sunday led them a wild chase towards the northwest, his cabman, evidently under the influence of more than common inducements, urging the horse at breakneck speed. But Syme was in no mood for delicacies, and he stood up in his own cab shouting, "'Stop, thief!' until crowds ran along beside his cab, and policemen began to stop and ask questions. All this had its influence upon the President's cabman, who began to look dubious and to slow down to a trot. He opened the trap to talk reasonably to his fare, and in so doing let the long whip droop over the front of the cab. Sunday leant forward, seized it, and jerked it violently out of the man's hand. Then, standing up in front of the cab himself, he lashed the horse and roared aloud so that they went down the streets like a flying storm. Through street after street and square after square went whirling this preposterous vehicle in which the fare was urging the horse, 
and the driver trying desperately to stop it. The other three cabs came after it, if the phrase be permissible of a cab, like panting hounds. Shops and streets shot by like rattling arrows. At the highest ecstasy of speed, Sunday turned round on the splashboard where he stood, and sticking his great grinning head out of the cab, with white hair whistling in the wind, he made a horrible face at his pursuers, like some colossal urchin. Then raising his right hand swiftly, he flung a ball of paper in Syme's face and vanished. Syme caught the thing while instinctively warding it off, and discovered that it consisted of two crumpled papers. One was addressed to himself, and the other to Dr. Bull with a very long, and it is, to be feared, partly ironical, string of letters after his name. Dr. Bull's address was, at any rate, considerably longer than his communication, for the communication consisted entirely of the words, "'What about Martin Tupper now?' "'What does the old maniac mean?' asked Bull, staring at the words. "'What does yours say, Syme?' Syme's message was, at any rate, longer, and ran as follows. "'No one would regret anything in the nature of an interference by the archdeacon more than I. I trust it will not come to that. But for the last time, where are your galoshes? The thing is too bad, especially after what Uncle said.' The President's cabman seemed to be regaining some control over his horse, and the pursuers gained little as they swept round into the Edgewell Road. And here there occurred what seemed to the Allies a providential stoppage. Traffic of every kind was swerving to right or left or stopping, for down the long road was coming the unmistakable roar announcing the fire engine, which in a few seconds went by like a brazen thunderbolt. But quick as it went by, Sunday had bounded out of his cab, sprung at the fire engine, caught it, slung himself on to it, and was seen as he disappeared in the noisy distance talking to the astonished fireman with explanatory gestures. "'After him!' howled Syme. "'He can't go astray now. There's no mistaking a fire engine.' The three cabmen, who had been stunned for a moment, whipped up their horses and slightly decreased the distance between themselves and their disappearing prey. The President acknowledged this proximity by coming to the back of the car, bowing repeatedly, kissing his hand, and finally flinging a neatly folded note into the bosom of Inspector Ratcliffe. When that gentleman opened it, not without impatience, he found it contained the words, "'Fly at once. The truth about your trouser-stretchers is known. A friend.' The fire engine had struck still farther to the north, into a region that they did not recognize. And as it ran by a line of high railings shadowed with trees, the six friends were startled, but somewhat relieved, to see the President leap from the fire engine, though whether through another whim or the increasing protest of his entertainers they could not see. Before the three cabs, however, could reach up to the spot, he had gone up the high railings like a huge gray cat, tossed himself over, and vanished in a darkness of leaves. Syme, with a furious gesture, stopped his cab, jumped out, and sprang also to the escalade. When he had one leg over the fence, and his friends were following, he turned a face on them which shone quite pale in the shadow. "'What place can this be?' he asked. "'Can it be the old devil's house? I've heard he has a house in North London.' "'All the better,' said the secretary grimly, planting a foot in a foothold. "'We shall find him at home.' "'No, but it isn't that,' said Syme, knitting his brows. I hear the most horrible noises, like devils laughing and sneezing and blowing their devilish noses. "'His dog's barking, of course,' said the secretary. "'Why not say his black beetle's barking?' said Syme furiously. "'Snails barking! Geraniums barking! Did you ever hear a dog bark like that?' He held up his hand, and there came out of the thicket a long growling roar that seemed to get under the skin and freeze the flesh, a low thrilling roar that made a throbbing in the air all about them. "'The dogs of Sunday would be no ordinary dogs,' said Gogol, and shuddered. Syme had jumped down on the other side, but he still stood listening impatiently. "'Well, listen to that,' he said. "'Is that a dog? Anybody's dog?' There broke upon their ear a hoarse screaming as of things protesting and clamoring in sudden pain, and then far off like an echo what sounded like a long nasal trumpet. "'Well, his house ought to be hell,' said the secretary. "'And if it is hell, I'm going in.' And he sprang over the tall railings almost with one swing. The others followed. They broke through a tangle of plants and shrubs and came out on an open path. Nothing was in sight, but Dr. Bull suddenly struck his hands together. "'Why, you asses!' he cried. "'It's the zoo!' As they were looking round wildly for any trace of their wild quarry, a keeper in uniform came running along the path with a man in plain clothes. "'Has it come this way?' gasped the keeper. "'Has what?' asked Syme. "'The elephant!' 
cried the keeper. An elephant has gone mad and run away. He has run away with an old gentleman, said the other stranger breathlessly. A poor old gentleman with white hair. What sort of old gentleman? asked Syme with great curiosity. A very large and fat old gentleman in light grey clothes, said the keeper eagerly. Well, said Syme, if he's that particular kind of old gentleman, if you're quite sure that he's a large and fat old gentleman in grey clothes, you may take my word for it that the elephant has not run away with him. He has run away with the elephant. The elephant is not made by God that could run away with him if he did not consent to the elopement, and by thunder there he is. There was no doubt about it this time. Lean across the space of grass, about two hundred yards away, with a crowd screaming and scampering vainly at his heels, with a huge grey elephant at an awful stride, with his trunk thrown out as rigid as a ship's bowsprit, and trumpeting like the trumpet of doom. On the back of the bellowing and plunging animal sat President Sunday, with all the placidity of a sultan, but goading the animal to a furious speed with some sharp object in his hand. "'Stop him!' screamed the populace. "'He'll be out of the gate!' "'Stop a landslide!' said the keeper. "'He is out of the gate!' And even as he spoke, a final crash and roar of terror announced that the great grey elephant had broken out of the gates of the zoological gardens and was careening down Albany Street like a new and swift sort of omnibus. "'Great Lord!' cried Bull. "'I never knew an elephant could go so fast. Well, it must be handsome cabs again if we were to keep him in sight.' As they raced along to the gate out of which the elephant had vanished, Syme felt a glaring panorama of the strange animals in the cages which they passed. Afterwards he thought it queer that he should have seen them so clearly. He remembered especially seeing pelicans with their preposterous pendant throats. He wondered why the pelican was the symbol of charity, except it was that it wanted a good deal of charity to admire a pelican. He remembered a hornbill, which was simply a huge yellow beak with a small bird tied on behind it. The whole gave him a sensation, the vividness of which he could not explain, that nature was always making quite mysterious jokes. Sunday had told him that they would understand him when they had understood the stars. He wondered whether even the archangels understood the hornbill. The six unhappy detectives flung themselves into cabs and followed the elephant, sharing the terror which he spread through the long stretch of the streets. This time Sunday did not turn round, but offered them the solid stretch of his unconscious back, which maddened them, if possible, more than his previous mockeries. Just before they came to Baker Street, however, he was seen to throw something far up into the air, as a boy does a ball meaning to catch it again. But at their rate of racing it fell far behind, just by the cab containing Gogol, and in faint hope of a clue or for some impulse unexplainable, he stopped his cab so as to pick it up. It was addressed to himself and was quite a bulky parcel. On examination, however, its bulk was found to consist of thirty-three pieces of paper of no value wrapped one round the other. When the last covering was torn away it reduced itself to a small slip of paper on which was written, The word, I fancy, should be pink. The man once known as Gogol said nothing, but the movements of his hands and feet were like those of a man urging a horse to renewed efforts. Through street after street, through district after district, went the prodigy of the flying elephant, calling crowds to every window and driving the traffic left and right, and still through all this insane publicity the three cabs toiled after it until they came to be regarded as part of a procession, and perhaps the advertisement of a circus. They went at such a rate that distances were shortened beyond belief and Syme saw the Albert Hall in Kensington when he thought that he was still in Paddington. The animal's place was even more fast and free through the empty, aristocratic streets of South Kensington, and he finally headed towards that part of the skyline where the enormous wheel of Earl's Court stood up in the sky. The wheel grew larger and larger till it filled heaven like the wheel of stars. The beast outstripped the cabs. They lost him round several corners, and when they came to one of the gates of the Earl's Court exhibition, they found themselves finally blocked. In front of them was an enormous crowd. In the midst of it was an enormous elephant, heaving and shuddering, as such shapeless creatures do. But the President had disappeared. "'Where has he gone to?' asked Syme, slipping to the ground. "'Gentlemen rushed into the exhibition, sir,' said an official in a dazed manner. Then he added in an injured voice, "'Funny gentleman, sir, asked me to hold his horse and gave me this.' He held out with distaste a piece of folded paper addressed to the secretary of the Central Anarchist Council. The secretary, raging, rent it open, and found written inside it, When the herring runs a mile, let the secretary smile. When the herring tries to fly, let the secretary die. Rustic proverb. Why, the eternal crikey, 
began the secretary. "'Did you let the man in? Do people commonly come to your exhibition riding on mad elephants? Do—' "'Look!' shouted Syme suddenly. "'Look over there!' "'Look at what?' asked the secretary savagely. "'Look at the captive balloon!' said Syme, and pointed in a frenzy. "'Why the blazes should I look at a captive balloon?' demanded the secretary. "'What is there queer about a captive balloon?' "'Nothing,' said Syme, "'except that it isn't captive.' They all turned their eyes to where the balloon swung and swelled above the exhibition on a string, like a child's balloon. A second afterwards the string came into just under the car, and the balloon, broken loose, floated away with the freedom of a soap bubble. Ten thousand devils!' shrieked the secretary. "'He's got into it!' and he shook his fists at the sky. The balloon, borne by some chance wind, came right above them, and they could see the great white head of the President peering over the side and looking benevolently down on them. "'God bless my soul,' said the professor, with the elderly manner that he could never disconnect from his bleached beard and parchment face. "'God bless my soul, I seem to fancy that something fell on the top of my hat.' He put up a trembling hand and took from that shelf a piece of twisted paper, which he opened absently, only to find it inscribed with a true lover's knot and the words, "'Your beauty has not left me indifferent from little snowdrop.' There was a short silence, and then Syme said, biting his beard, "'I'm not beaten yet. The blasted thing must come down somewhere. Let's follow it!' End of chapter 13